Healing. Uh, coming up on April 26th, we have our Model UN at the State Department. Uh, young people from uh, middle schools and high schools throughout the area will come to the State Department. It's the largest event hosted by the State Department every year. And uh, we always invite the Secretary. I'm not sure if he's going to be traveling or able to be our keynote speaker this year, but it will be quite a wonderful event. And in December, we have our Human Rights Awards. If you have any candidates you think should be uh, uh, a recipient of our Human Rights Awards, you're welcome to, to uh, let us know. And uh, we'll go through a process of selecting outstanding candidates. So the High Commissioner for Human Rights was our, one of our um, most recent recipients. Um, so that's just an overview. Check out our website. Uh, if you join us, you'll get UN Express. But it'll keep you posted on the number of programs in our sustainability committee is doing a series on the Northern Triangle, migration and refugees, which will be quite uh, timely and fascinating. So I encourage you to check us out and join us if you can. And uh, look forward very much to today's presentation, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Don, and thanks everyone for getting involved in other activities of our partner, UNA National Capital Area. So with uh, Christine, uh, we're, we're super excited. She's part of a, a nine-talk uh, uh, tour in as many days uh, right now. Uh, last week was at the International Studies Association annual meeting in Toronto, heading to Scotland directly from this event, and as you know, based at King's College London. Um, she, there's some friends here, classmates from her Princeton master's program and one of her professors from Princeton. But uh, I would like to briefly share that I met uh, Christine during my doctoral studies and along with a German scholar named Dr. Dominic Zong, you might know of his work, also in the same field, peace building. We did a uh, event together on peace building and corruption back in our grad school days. And, and through our own doctoral studies, we're very pleased that our books were published in what has become unofficially known as the Peace Building, State Building series of Oxford University Press. Make sure you ask Christine afterwards to get the 30% discount to the book before ordering it online, um, and which you'll definitely want to after you hear Christine's uh, remarks. Uh, second point, uh, people might be uh, aware of this subject matter, that it gets too much attention around political institution building and governance. That certainly was my focus earlier in my career. When you go out and do peace building, though, you learn that after an election, after a new constitution, it all becomes about uh, delivering public goods, economic uh, revitalization. So Christine, as you'll see in her remarks today, has really put her finger on the other key aspect, uh, which in some ways is more important than political institution building to the process of state building in fragile post-conflict settings. Today, uh, we're also going to be uh, hearing from our uh, colleague Liz Hume, who's no stranger in the peace building community. Let me introduce briefly both Christine and Liz, and then we'll uh, hear from uh, Christine first, then Liz, and, and have a conversation today. Uh, we will be encouraging everybody to use the microphone for the simple reason that we have friends participating by a live stream, and it's uh, important that uh, your voices are picked up for audio purposes. Christine is uh, a lecturer currently in war studies at King's College London. Uh, also, uh, another activity she's engaged in at the moment, a big study that's funded by uh, the UK uh, Department for International Development with working with Chatham House on countering war economies in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Libya, topics that are very uh, uh, much welcome and appreciated in this town where we're discussing these issues constantly, daily. Um, at uh, King's College, she's teaching a course, uh, courses on conflict, security, and development. Uh, as noted, uh, DPhil at Oxford and, and um, also studies at uh, the Woodrow Wilson School and in uh, Waterloo, Canada. Um, it was great catching up with her in recent days and also hearing about the really important uh, work she's involved in on gender equality issues and increasing the number of women candidates in politics in many countries that she has uh, engagements with over the years, including the UK, Canada, and the US. Liz Hume, again, no stranger to this audience, but Vice President and Senior Director for Programs and Strategy at the Alliance for Peacebuilding. She has over 20 years of experience in senior leadership positions with multilateral organizations, USAID, and nonprofit entities. Uh, she is um, a lawyer and has a master's degree in negotiations, conflict resolution, and peacebuilding. So first we'll have a presentation, nice PowerPoint slides, I believe, from Christine, and then we'll hear from our discussant, Liz. Welcome. So, thank you, uh, Richard. Can I can I steal the mic for a second to see what we can have yeah, better sure. audio? Yep, um, Sorry. But the first thing I want to say is, if you want the book, just email me and I will send you the PDF. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> the book is really expensive. It's eighty-five dollars. I know that is not realistic for most people. It is not realistic for me. So, if you really want to read the book, just send me an email. So that's the first thing. 
Second thing is, don't tell my publisher. <laughs> um, I will pass it around in case you want to take a look at it. So first of all, thank you so much, Richard, uh, for inviting me. Thank you for setting all of this up. Thank you to your amazing staff who have made all of this possible. I I'm a bit of a pacer, so I'm going to go up and, and talk up at the front with my slides. I'm so grateful, actually, to also have classmates in the room and a former professor of mine and longtime mentor for 19 years, Rick Barton. Uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here. And I hope that you'll st still like me as much at the end of the talk as you do at the beginning of the talk, <laughs> because I'm going to say some things that I think are provocative uh, and deliberately so. Um, and I hope that Liz will, Liz and I are already on the same page. We know that from the conversation that we had before. Um, but I'm looking forward to Liz, what Liz has to say and her, her reactions to my hopefully provocative comments. So the book, the short summary of the book is this. It's about ex-combatant groups that take over natural resource areas for profit after war. And in doing so, they build autonomous local political orders that provide basic forms of governance. So I'm going to break that down for you. But essentially, that's the whole book in a nutshell. But I'm going to do a bunch of things with you that will make that story a little bit more complicated. The first thing I'm going to do is actually zoom in really up close with you to talk about the kinds of groups, the kinds of people that we're dealing with. And I think that tells us something, right, about the microdynamics of war. Looking really, really closely at a place to talk about specific instances and what that looks like. The second thing is, and we were talking about this earlier, Liz and I, this is a bit of a mirror. Right? The book is a bit of a mirror. It will reflect back to us our policies, our ideas, our values, our assumptions, our biases. So this book is trying to do that. And in a way, it's trying to translate between different worlds. People who live and work in conflict-affected places and fragile states, what we would call failed states, and us you know, here in the West, which is mostly you know, where I live. I live in London. Um, I'm Canadian. And I have a very westernized background. I see things through Western eyes trying to translate between those worlds, reflecting back on that is part of what this book is trying to do. This last image is just of an inkblot test. So for the psychologists in the room, you'll know that inkblot tests are really designed to um, tell us something about what the person is thinking, right? What you see in the image reflects something back on ourselves. And I think this idea, the metaphor of extra legal groups, does something for us. What you see in extra legal groups will tell you more about yourself, possibly, than about the phenomenon itself. What you might see is a security threat. You might see bad people breaking the law. You might see an informal business. You might see protectors providing employment. What you might see is a public-private partnership. They're all different ways of describing the thing that I'm going to talk about. I come from more of a security background, so I will and I will say, I, you know, I came at it from a security threat angle. And then I worked through all of these other ideas. And I will work them through with you through the course of this talk. Now, here's the provocative bit. Okay? So I've got a bunch of propositions for you. You probably won't agree with most of them. So the first one is that crime is not about breaking the law. The second one is that the law is not necessarily a meaningful reference point. The third one is that categories can limit our understanding. So, for example, state, non-state, formal, informal, licit, illicit, legal, illegal. The fourth one is that strengthening states can actually do more harm than good. And this will be difficult for those of you who work on international state building. Uh, it was difficult when I talked to the UN people about this last week. The fifth one is finally now at the core of the book. Extra legal groups can actually be state builders. And the sixth one is that it's trade that makes a state. So, Hopefully, by the end of the talk, you'll sort of see where I'm coming from uh, as I talk through these ideas. The book look, roughly looks like this. I can't talk through everything, um, but if you're interested, I spend a fair chunk of time talking about Liberia's history and its relationship with the U.S. And I think it's really fascinating um, given how much history there is between Liberia and the U.S. I talk about the Civil War, and then I talk specifically about uh, the various sectors, rubber, timber, and diamonds. Um, but today, I'm really going to focus on the state building aspect of it and the theoretical framework. So we'll talk through a little bit, just to give you a sense of Liberia, about the project, some definitions, my first research question, a framework, a second research question, and then we'll talk about state building and kind of going back to those propositions. And then just an, a quick note about doing honest research. So where is Liberia? 
for those of you who don't work on Africa, I think it's important to think about where Liberia is and how small it is. So it's pretty tiny. Um, you can see it kind of fits into a corner of several other larger countries around it. But importantly, who else is in the region? Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Cote d'Ivoire. So for those of you, again, who are coming from a security perspective, I mean, the US actually cares about Liberia because of a historical relationship. But the British, you know, they don't necessarily care about Liberia, but they do really care about Sierra Leone. And Charles Taylor's role at the end of the war and during the Civil War really affected the impact on Sierra Leone. A lot of money was spent in Sierra Leone. The UK cares about Liberia to the extent that it destabilizes Sierra Leone. Similarly, France cares about Cote d'Ivoire, right? They don't necessarily care about Liberia per se, but again, this destabilizing relationship uh, between Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire is something that's important, and with Guinea as well. So this is, this is a regional conflict, and the regional dynamics come into it um, at various points in my discussion. If we're talking about Liberia, most of you will think of these two folks, the first one being Charles Taylor, uh, warlord turned president, uh, now imprisoned by the Special Court of Sierra Leone for war crimes. He's just outside of Durham, the city of Durham in the UK, in Franklin Prison. If anyone wants to go visit him, he'll probably be there until he dies. Uh, and the other person that you'll probably think of is someone who, a familiar face, Nobel Prize winner, uh, first elected female president uh, within Africa, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and former World Bank employee. So some of you may know her from your days when she was a bank employee. And between these two folks, we have a civil war. So the, the civil war went on, on and off. And again, the on and off part is important, right? On and off for 14 years from 89 to 2003. There were roughly 100,000 people killed in combat deaths. Uh, a million people were displaced, some of them multiple times. There was a sponsored war in Sierra Leone, an attempted coup in Guinea, and lots and lots of peacekeepers, right? This was, and going back to how small Liberia was, this was perhaps the densest concentration of peacekeepers per um, population, you know, and also per square kilometer that the UN has ever had, maybe except outside of um, the Balkans, right? So this is an East Timor. So this is definitely one of the, in some ways, the best, our best hope for trying to do this kind of work, right? Lots and lots of peacekeepers, a lot of money, a lot, quite a lot of political will at the end of that war, uh, and you know, a really large number of peacekeepers. So this is what the, the situation looks like. If we're thinking about fragile states, though, and Africa, this is usually the kind of thing that would come to mind. What is a failed state? This is the kind of thing that people think about. And I want to take us beyond images like this. I want to tell a more complicated story about what a failed state actually looks like and what it means in practice. Um, kind of reminding me of some of the early work that Rick did at CSIS a long, long time ago is just to think about capacity in a different way. What does security look like on the ground? So this was a police cell in rural ish Liberia. It was a capital city in a kind of rural area. Um, you can see that there's, this is the lock on the door. So <laughs> you can see it's, it's pretty easy to get out if you want to. Um, but importantly, they had, forget computers, forget cars, forget motorcycles, forget, you know, means of transportation, forget, uh, pens and paper even, forget handcuffs. If you are put in jail, you don't even have food. Somebody actually has to come and bring your food to you and water. So when we're talking about state capacity, what does that look like? What does, what does that look like in places like Liberia after the end of the Civil War? It looks like this, right? That's the reality of, of state capacity. And I think that's a, a better way of illustrating it uh, than you know, showing the kinds of images that I showed you before. Another thing to bear in mind about Liberia specifically is that there's just a lot of green space. It's really hard to get from A to B. Uh, there aren't a lot of roads, and even though the country is really, really small, it's just really difficult because half the year it's rainy season and it takes 12 hours to 24 hours if your car gets stuck in the mud. And something that should take, you know, to go 100 miles, it might take you, again, a whole day, right? And with several people trying to push your vehicle out of the mud. So to get from A to B, to get your goods to market, 
can take a really, really long time. And the geography of that matters, right? Where you are in relation to the capital. So these are the kinds of folks, uh, you know, lured rebels coming into Monrovia at the end of the Civil War. And we're thinking about them and their coercive capacity and what they do at the end of Civil War. So just bear these folks in mind. So what do we see at the end of the Liberian Civil War? On the surface, we have a very smooth post-conflict transition. There's quite a, there's quite, um, you know, Liberia is a poster child for the UN in many ways, and, and rightfully so, right? So I, I don't want to disregard that. I think they've done an excellent job. I think largely it's, it's done much better than I ever expected it to do. Uh, it is a thriving place compared to what it was when I first arrived in 2005. So on the surface, we have this smooth post-conflict transition, and that is the story we like to tell about it. Beneath the surface, though, and even at the time, you know, we were telling this narrative of a successful case, there was quite a lot of local variation depending on where you were in the country. And the key challenge was that there was a lot of resistance to government authority in important natural resource areas. So ex-combatants held onto these areas, and they did so for years, years in some cases, despite the fact that the UN was there on the ground with their, you know, many 10, like 13 to 15,000 peacekeepers. When the government tried to evacuate some of these groups, they often became violent or threatened to become very violent. So to give you a sense of what it felt like at the end of the Civil War, and it's hard to imagine this because things feel so calm and peaceful now, but at that time, and again, that intermittent period in 97 when Taylor took power, people thought the same thing, right? People thought that the country might be out of war, that things would be calm and peaceful again. So. You can understand why in 2003, after they'd signed the peace accord, they were very hesitant to actually believe that the war had come to an end, right? They were still uncertain. And they were uncertain because of groups like this. So what will happen when the simmering discontent at Guthrie becomes open clashes between former Lord Generals and their stooges who are armed and the deprived civilians? Add that scenario to the situation in the Sino-Rubber Plantation, where one General Satan of the former Modell rebel militias is holding out and bragging about his right over the plantation. We have a potentially explosive situation at hand in those plantations. So this was just from a local newspaper. It gives you a sense of what it was like at the time and how people were feeling, how they felt about these groups, and how worried and scared they were that they would take the country back to war. So why? Why should we care about these groups over here? Well. The first is that peace was very unevenly experienced depending on where you lived in the country. So the groups were obviously a threat to local security. Um, they could have taken the country back to war. There was obviously also the dimension of regional insecurity that we might care about depending on you know, who you are on the Security Council. Uh, there were also this issue of trade-offs, right? On the one hand, we're endorsing political stability and turning a blind eye to these groups. And that signals a kind of impunity that we say we're against in the West. But on the other hand, we're not fully acknowledging what is going on here. The problem is that disrupting these groups could also incite that return to war that we're trying to avoid, right? So things look relatively stable. What do we do about these groups? And how we read these groups really tells us something about our values and I think our mistaken assumptions in policy making and in scholarship. And I'll, again, walk us through that later on. For Liberians, obviously, why should they care, aside from the obvious, is that I think they're really concerned about corruption. When I go back to Liberia, the thing that they're talking about all the time is corruption. And part of what this book is trying to do is talk about why it's such a hard, what political scientists would call a path-dependent problem, right? That one step is almost automatically going to lead to the next, and it's very hard to veer off of that path. And it also contrasts their thinking, Liberian thinking, local Liberian thinking, um, and NGO thinking, and their expectations versus ours, right, outside, the people who are in many cases providing that money and funding and policy making. Okay, now I get to the main event. I had to set it all up so that you can see at least where it is that I'm coming from. So an extra legal group exists outside the law. It has a proven capacity for violence, and it provides governance functions to further business interests. So the key bit here is around governance functions to further business interests. The rest of it might sound kind of familiar in various forms of non-state armed groups, but the thing that they're doing that is different and interesting, uh, and the way to think about it that is different and interesting, is really around this provision of governance functions. And not to take over the state per se, but in order just to allow trade to flourish. State building, I talk about, 
in very stripped down terms. So this is the process of building institutions that provide public goods. I don't really care who does it. I don't care if you're the state. I don't care if you're a non-state group. I don't care if you're violent or not. I'm just thinking about what is being done. So the question that I first ask is, how do these groups come about? How do they emerge and then become locally entrenched after the end of civil war? And I work through a bunch of political science concepts, some of which are taken um, from economics, from um, sociology, and specifically with respect to the mafia, if you're interested, and then state building, um, some work from Africa, and then thinking through this idea that I call conflict capital. And that's around what happens when a group of people experience, see, violence together on a continued basis. What kinds of norms and institutions develop out of that common interaction and experience? And what happens when that builds up over time? So at the beginning of war, I argue that we have very, very low levels of conflict capital, and this increases um, as we go through the war, and you end up with quite a lot of conflict capital after the end of war. If you leave that conflict capital to die, so those relationships to die, it will eventually go away on its own. And you can see that also you know, in, in different parts of the world, that over time, relationships just fade. Disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs are trying to actively destroy that conflict capital. And what happens with extralegal groups is that they continue to activate that conflict capital. And the ways in which this happens, this helps us understand how um, extralegal groups emerge. So going back to those young men, and it is mostly young men. They're coming out of war. They're unemployed. They're poorly educated. They don't have a lot of skills. They don't have a lot of capital. What do they do in a place like Liberia? Where do they end up? Well, there aren't a lot of choices for them. So they're really looking to things like manual labor, and they end up mostly in the same kinds of physical, geographical spaces, right? They end up doing rubber tapping, diamond mining, maybe gold mining, and if they have more money, then they'll, they can get some money to buy a chainsaw and they end up doing pit sign, which is effectively logging, right? Artisanal logging. Um, so we have a competition for unskilled employment. This creates a demand for credible and internal dispute resolution and regulation. And then on the other hand, we have this ready supply of people who've been active in war and know how to use violence. And then we have conflict capital. And we have these people in this space, and what they're trying to do, actually, is just make a living. They're trying to survive, and they're trying to make trade work, right? They're trying to get their diamonds to market, and they're trying to do the logging. But there are disputes between them, as there are in any commercial environment. How do you enforce contracts when other people around you are violent or could use violence against you and you don't trust them and there is no other institution to provide that kind of backup, right? We've got laws and norms and we've got um, other ways of dealing with our disputes. In this kind of environment after war, not all of that is there. Uh, it's not necessarily there even before the start of war. So you can imagine what it's like. So how do these groups how do people in this environment deal with that when you've got thousands of them in these areas? So I argue that what happens is something has to emerge. Sometimes multiple groups emerge and they contest over that authority, but something has to provide that dispute resolution and regulation in order to make those markets work. So that's where the trade bit comes in. So out of that process, um, an extra legal group emerges. And then the next bit is, a, the interesting, the next interesting bit is around coercive taxation. So some of these groups decide, actually, we don't need to actually do the work. We can just tax the people who are here. There are lots and lots of them. Why not just take a cut of what they're doing? Let's take 20%, 30%, 50% in some cases. Uh, and we can, in that process, both build financial capacity, but importantly, organizational capacity. So they grow stronger out of that process. And then they realize, oh, let's hold on to these areas. Isn't this more lucrative? Why don't we just stay here for as long as possible? And so they end up bribing local officials, all sorts of... Um, all the people who would typically provide an obstacle through our state mechanisms, you can just bribe. And you can... Think how, about how easy that is, given the, the photos that I showed you of what the police look like, right? Just as an example. So it costs you almost nothing, next to nothing, to get out of jail, right? There is literally a get out of jail free card if you want it. And you can imagine that many other institutions also 
uh, have the same kind of problem. So we've got what I call the weakest link problem. So it, to escape entrenchment, core state institutions need to be simultaneously empowered. So we've got the police, the military, the courts, judges, lawyers, prisons, politicians, uh, chiefs, elders, on and on, right? All of your, all of the people who would normally do this kind of thing, they have to together decide to fight entrenchment. Any one of these functions can be captured and corrupted by what I call private interests, right? By these groups. And I would take this even further and say that the default setting for all states, not just Liberia, not just failed states, not just fragile states, all states, um, is it, it looks something like this. And I use the example of the UK because I often give this talk to policymakers in the UK and to academics in the UK. And we think back to you know, what those institutions looked like and how difficult it was to create those institutions out of that space. Um, how do you bring everybody on board at once? This is not dissimilar, right? This is just a long, long-term state building process. So the book basically looks at the various sectors of the economy and it, you know, it goes through and works through this framework um, through rubber, timber, and diamonds. It shows a bunch of things that are kind of obvious. It basically says that the framework more or less works. This is what I actually find on the ground. Um, but importantly, the groups do something else and that is just provide employment. So we need to think about this kind of thing differently. And it goes back to that inkblot test that I showed you, right? You see different things. So you can see them, as local librarians did, as basically facilitators of informal business, right? That's a different way of thinking about these groups. And they were stabilizing the environment in a way that I don't think we gave them adequate credit for um, at the end of the war. So if I showed you this picture, instead of the other picture of the young men storming into Monrovia, you'd have a very different sense of who they are and what they do, right? So it's, I mean, this is stolen from a friend of mine, um, but it's basically from Lofa Bridge, it's diamond mining, and that's what people look like when they're mining diamonds. You get a very different sense of that space and what is going on, and there is, it's the same kinds of people that are doing that kind of work, but it's just framed very differently for us. So the second question is around state building. And this, is, this goes to larger thematic areas about how we think about this, this stuff. So what, purposes, what purpose do extra legal groups serve? So they're unintentional state builders, I argue, and they contribute to state learning. So in addition to the things that I described, they also do some other interesting things. And we have to think about that in the context of where they're coming from. So at the end of Civil War, you have quite a lot of vigilante violence going on. Uh, people are enforcing disputes between one another in a very personal way. Um, they're just, you know, it's, it's interpersonal conflict dispute resolution, but quite violently so in a lot of cases. So how do you think about that? How, you, how do you deal with that? Well, part of what the groups are trying to do is they're removing the right of individuals to judge and enforce their own disputes. And that's a weird concept because I think if we were coming from an environment where the state works, this idea just, we don't do this, right? We don't, we don't do vigilantism. But where you do, you need to be able to take yourself out of that situation and then decide to give somebody else that authority. So you're effectively establishing the role of an intermediary between conflicting parties. And then the other thing that the groups are doing is they're consolidating coercive authority at the local level. And then this other weird thing that is inadvertently going on that again, most of us aren't aware of, is they're socializing communities into being governed, right? And that is not something, again, that is intuitive to people who have grown up with a vibrant state and who have benefited from the state, as I'm sure we all have here at the table. So the idea of being governed, I mean, if you go into remote parts of, certainly of Liberia, probably in Africa and the rest of the world, they will say, who is the state? Like, what are you talking about? I have no interaction with the state. Or worse, if you do have interactions with the state, it has been incredibly predatory, really harmful. It has stolen from us, coerced us, um, taxed us in horrible ways. You look back into the history of Liberia and you should be scared of the state. It makes sense to be scared of the state. So it's hard. It's hard to convince people to trust the state. There is a socialization process that is going on. And I think part of what these groups do extremely imperfectly, very, very imperfectly, but part of what they're trying to do is socialize, not trying, part of what they end up doing is socialize communities into being governed. And this creates a repertoire of responses uh, from the state itself. The state is trying to learn how to be a state, right? There is a process of learning here that I don't think we fully acknowledge. 
institutions have to learn how to be institutions. And part of what is going on is you have riots, rebellions, civil wars, coups, you have all sorts of stuff, you know, back and forth between state and society. These groups, that's part of that process. And out of that process, we end up with this idea of state resilience, right? States learn how to do a better job of managing these kinds of situations. The second argument is that now finally, you know, contemporary trade, contemporary state building is driven by trade and commerce and not war. And this comes out of what I call the kernel of the state, that extra legal groups are doing these two things. They provide physical security and impartial justice. So trade requires a stable commercial environment and it's underpinned by those two things. Uh, and the extra legal groups are not motivated to take over the state per se, they're motivated by profit. They just want to, or survival in many cases, right? They're just trying to make trade work. They're trying to make the market work. So it's trade, not war, not something else, that is driving these kinds of state building processes. So what do we do with all of this? What about places where the state has no presence? There are no public goods, there are no institutions. Do we let these groups develop because they can provide public goods? Is something in these places better than nothing? Should we shut them down because they're not, they're not the state itself? We're not allowed to interact with them? Do we engage with them? Do we legitimize them? What do we do with them? If we let them be, then you've got an accountability problem in the long run, and you've also got an autonomy problem in the long run. So what do we do with them? And this is kind of to say that at the end of war, um, you've got these extra legal groups inside the state, in some cases people wearing two hats at the same time, both formal and informal. And in fact, most of us think about the groups like this, right? We think that there's a very clear, there should be a very clear boundary between the law uh, that divides what these groups do and then what the state is. And I think in reality, most states are here in the middle. I think all of our states are pretty much here in the middle. And it's, the question is to what extent there is overlap between these things. So if we have to rethink state building, I would say that there's a long-term process taking, here, taking place here, and it takes different amounts of time to build that kernel of the state. The rate, in some cases, of state learning is faster for uh, the states that come at it at a later stage. So China, for example, is learning a lot from the mistakes of the West in the state building process. Um, and then, again, some, some things that are more interesting here that I think path to, the path to modern statehood isn't planned and deliberate, right? In 1200, when, roughly in 1200, when the Magna Carta was actually first put down in, on paper, nobody in the UK said, nobody in England at that time said, oh, actually, we're going to end up with this perfect liberal state at the end of this in 800 years that everybody's going to stand for. Uh, and instead, what happened was this back and forth process between the kings and the monarchs and uh, the feudal lords and the barons and so on. And there was a fight between the population and the people, the elites that controlled them, right? And then at the end of all of that, we end up where we are today. But there was no deliberate thought saying, oh, we're going to end up and it's going to look like this. It's much more organic. It's much more unpredictable than I think we give it credit for. And this is to say that these processes need to be internally driven in order for them to be sustainable. We can't really impose this stuff. It just won't stick. So here's another bit that may be difficult, and you can disagree with me. I don't think all states aspire to be liberal necessarily. Uh, and I, I've come to that actually from a very difficult place. I, I didn't start out thinking that. Uh, but I think, you know, having seen and visited lots of different places now, I'm not convinced that my former self was right. I, I think that it, there's much more of a question mark around this, certainly now, than there used to be. Each step along that state building path doesn't need to be liberal to arrive at a liberal end state, right? So this is balancing out that other point that, again, the UK didn't set out um, to be like this, and it certainly wasn't like that. And the US wasn't like that. If we think back 100 years ago to who had power and how power was wielded, incredibly uneven, incredibly unequal. So at the end of that, though, I think the thing that we have today in both the UK and the US is something that looks much closer to what we would all agree is a liberal state. So just because the past doesn't look like that doesn't mean that the future won't. 
The thing that we do around strengthening the state, though, and the assumptions that we make around the state, and the, the ways in which we engage with policymakers, we assume that people want more state, right? We assume that security sector reform is a good idea. But if the state has been nothing but bad to you, you should be very wary of the state and increasing that state capacity because more often than not, it is being used against local populations to kill more and more people, to extract more and more, and you know, to commit various kinds of human rights abuses. So if you are a local person, a local civilian in these places, you are right to be scared of state strengthening. And I don't think we take that into account in our policy making. And this is finally to say that I think the liberal template, the way that we conceive of it and actually do it and implement it is too rigid, it's very righteous, it's ahistorical, and as a Rwandan uh, in, in Canada recently said to me, it's quite sanctimonious. And I worry about that. I, I don't think that the ways in which we are doing things and, well, our lack of honesty with ourselves about this is, I think, just causing problems for us. So the book talks about this idea of the good state, right? The fact that we are all in this room together means that all of us have benefited from the state. We are the, you know, we are the ones that have done well out of this kind of state building. The people that didn't make it are not in this room, and they will not be reading the book. We don't get to tell their story of the not good state, right? The harmful state, the scary state. This is to say also that you know there are different ways of thinking of governance. Who governs you? I think that's a question that Rick has asked in previous work, and I, I think about it, right? Like if you ask somebody in the favelas in Rio. You, you ask them who governs you, they would say their local gang leader. They would not name a political leader who has a state position. They would not, in my case, you know, I would say Theresa May, I might say Sadiq Khan, I might talk about my local council members. Um, that's a very different kind of conversation. And we are not having the who actually does stuff for you on the ground conversation. And this is to say that there are overlapping spheres of crime and conflict here and we're not really acknowledging those. Why do some kinds of violence matter and other kinds of violence don't, right? What is going on where we have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people being killed in Latin America because of the drug wars, and that is seen as crime, whereas we talk about conflict, international conflict, in a very different way. The quality of peace matters. What, is that? what does that look like? National peace doesn't imply local peace so much variation that we don't acknowledge. What about consolidating the peace, right? How should we do that? Do we need to configure a new coexistence? Is that the bar? Are we talking about reconstituting state institutions? Is that the bar? The work on the resource curse. I think we don't talk about the legacy of a lot of these networks. So Richard was talking about a project that I'm working on with Chatham House. Um, one of the things that has, we're talking about, the policy implications of previous policies. So the Iraq sanctions and the, the oil smuggling networks that came out of that are now being used by ISIS, right? Or were up until recently. And that's, that's a legacy of an international policy that was put in place to deal with a particular problem that has had, you know, that has survived th the past 30 years and has come back to bite us. There's also quite a lot of resource war discussion uh, within the literature, and I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I think we need a more nuanced and careful thinking through of how resources actually play out in these places, and there are different ways of framing it, as I've tried to show here. So we've got a bunch of biases, I think, and assumptions, and I'm starting with myself here, right? So I started with much more of a dichotomy way of thinking about the world. I then moved to a way that looks more like a spectrum of things that is going on, and I think now I've moved to a systems way of thinking. So I started off with very clear dichotomies, people that are good and people that are bad, uh, and then I thought, oh, actually, there, you know, there are mixed motives here, but I think the ecosystem way is a more interesting way of framing it. So if you change something within a system, there are so many unintended, unexpected consequences, and you're not really sure what happens when you change that one bit. And I think that's a, that's a more humble way of thinking about our, spe specifically our policy effects on these kinds of war economies and war to peace transitions. Is peace the ultimate good here? And do we even agree on what that version of peace should look like? If we're talking about security, what version of security? Does it make sense that on the one hand, we're ending what we call you know, competitive violence, right? Armed group violence on the one hand. And then in the household, there's all sorts of domestic violence going on. I mean, we don't care about that in the same way that we care about the stuff that goes on outside of the house. So you've just saved a person, uh, you know, typically a woman or a child, 
from domestic or from you know competitive a situation of competitive armed violence, and then in the home they're being abused and their physical security is a threat, and yet one matters and the other doesn't. We are not asking those kinds of questions in our work. And then the law and the state, what does that mean? I mean, I had a really tough time with this as somebody who thought about the law and the state in very rigid ways. And what I saw up close is that both of those things can be very much personalized and they're very context dependent and they're power dependent. And we don't recognize a lot of that both neither in our scholarship nor in our policy work. So some of this is to say that I think we should be supporting domestic political legitimacy better with an eye on second, third, fourth, fifth order effects. I think as Richard tried to emphasize, we need to think a lot more and a lot better about livelihoods. If you care about state building, then, and I'm not saying that state building is actually the answer here. I'm quite, as you can tell, a little bit worried and skeptical, but I think we need to build, do a better job of building trust in the state, and that has to do with providing, actually providing local public goods that people can use and trying to measure that as a specific outcome. I think we should be careful about judging based on Western standards. And I think the groups themselves that I talk about can evolve and change over time. And we need to give them the space to do that and become more responsive to local people. So I take you back to the propositions. And I hope they seem a little bit less crazy than they did when we started the talk. Um, I think that some of the things that I'm talking about have applications in other places. And maybe in your head, you're thinking about that. I'm hoping Liz will speak to some of that in a moment. And this is just finally to say that you know, there's a chapter at the end of the book. It's mostly for scholars. But it basically says that I didn't believe anything that I started with um, at the beginning of this project. Right? So I write a very different kind. I ended up writing a very different kind of book. Uh, and part of that as we were discussing earlier, meant that I had to see things that I didn't want to see. And then I had to internalize those ideas. And that caused a lot of cognitive dissonance for me as a Canadian, right? As somebody who really believes in peacekeeping and trying to do good in the world. And then I didn't like what I saw, but I didn't know how to not see it either. And that meant, I would say, for the past 10 years, reworking how I think about these things and what we are doing, and reworking, sadly, uh, my own values, my own beliefs, and my own assumptions about how this works and our role in it uh, from the outside. So I don't, you know, a lot of the times we start out with one idea of what we expect to see, and then we see something different, and it's really hard to actually acknowledge that thing without having to do a lot of the other hard work that goes into rethinking everything that we believe. and. I, I don't know that, I think that's a really hard process, right? So, and I think being honest with ourselves, and part of what I hope this book is trying to, what this book does is to open up the space for that conversation to acknowledge those difficulties, right? I'm not, I'm not sure where we're going to go at the end of this, or even what I'd advocate for, but I think the conversation and that ability to be honest, at least in small groups, maybe with people that you trust, um, and to be able to say some of these difficult things that I know people are saying in the background but can't have openly at a formal meeting with policymakers, I'm hoping those conversations will start to take place. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christine, for such an engaging and thorough overview of your highly original research. It challenges us on so many levels to um, question what has been conventional wisdom in this town and, and the community at large working on peace building and state building, beginning with your two main arguments, extra legal groups are unintentional state builders and contemporary state building is driven by trade and commerce, not war as so much of the literature has looked at. And, and especially this last point where you challenge uh, something that is seen quite widely today with the resurgence of authoritarianism that not all states aspire to be liberal. To begin our discussion portion of the program, so start thinking about your questions now for Christine and, and, and comments you may have, but we'll begin with our colleague Liz. And how much time? It's under 10 minutes, I would hope. Yay. Okay. Um, so I'll start off. When Richard um, called me and asked me to be the discussant on this book, I looked at the title and I said, I'm not an expert in trade and I'm not an expert in Liberia, so I don't know why you're calling me, Richard. Um, but when I started looking at it, I understood. Um, as you go through these, all these examples and everything you've done, um, you're ticking off 
your own examples of everywhere you worked. So, you know, I, you know, Bosnia, Afghanistan, looking at Yemen right now. Um, I mean, you can just tick off. Um, so we all have those examples. Um, and just, you mentioned, I know you had up there the Balkans. Um, I was the chief legal counsel there. I was seconded by the State Department to the OSCE. And I, one of my roles was to um, write the legal framework to implement the Dayton Peace Accords. Um, and uh, we saw all of this happening. We saw, you know, all the, um, the war, the war, what would you call it, the economy, um, and all the different ex extra legal um, judicial groups. Um, and we would sit there and go, I have no idea how to deal with that. Absolutely none. We're trying to build the state, and our framework was very much top down. Um, because that's what, how it was written in the Day Dayton Peace Accords. Um, it was, let's fix the state, and then the state will fix everything else, and it will trickle down, and we won't have to worry about that. But honestly, we had no idea what even, you know, what to do. Um, and the problem was so complex and actually kind of scary. Um, you know, we are civilians. Um, we were working with S4 at the time. Um, their mandate was only to protect people like me, and if they tripped over a war criminal, you know, and they had to pick them up, they would pick them up um, and send them off to The Hague, but that was really their role. Um, so that's also a problem. I mean, it's scary, coupled with the fact of where the funding lies. Um, you know, the, the development funding has, um, in many countries and, and in the U.S., is very tied to development program, not to hit, not to go near police keeping. Um, it's really the Brits have that money that changes colors and can be used um, interchangeably. In the US, we are very hamstrung by those different accounts. Um, so how do you even go near those people? Coupled with the fact that a lot of those groups pop up on our, now on our foreign terrorist list. Um, I'm sure everybody might have heard this morning on NPR, we just added the new one. Um, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard is on there. Um, so you always also have to be very careful in terms of, you know, I'm not going to jail to work with these people and provide material support, which means even just communicating with them. But even today, we're seeing this very much played out in Yemen. Um, you know, it, to kind of the average person, it's like, you know, Yemen is just a massive conflict and a war and being bombed continuously. But within Yemen, there are sec secure areas, areas that are working, and you know we know you don't have to work for the government and have access to intel briefings that Al-Qaeda is moving in these places. And what are they doing? They're providing resources <laughs> and governance and security and services are being delivered. Um, and we know that, um, and and that's you know becoming also um, I, I don't want to say people they've caught on, um, but uh, you know they do it a lot better than we do um, in many places, and we can actually learn um, uh, from how they are building sort of that own community governance um, uh, structure. And then that also Christine and I were talking about earlier. What I think is difficult about this is. Um, that hybrid, it's a sliding scale. So when is this group just a group trying to, you know, get means and trade and, and okay, and I, and I have to, you know, keep the area somewhat secure. Um, and when do they grow and when do they become a political body? Uh, we mentioned the FARC, for example. Um, and so there is that sliding scale and I, you know, it, it's hard to put them in, or any of these groups, in one set box, because they will slide up and down that scale. Um, what I think is so, what I think this book is so opportune right now, uh, because so many of us, the UN, the US government, um, uh, the report that came out of the, the World Bank, we are all struggling with, um, we have to do things differently. Um, and the frameworks and the approaches that we put on countries post-conflict um, haven't worked that well. And so there is this sort of group rethink right 
right now, and so why I think this book is so opportune. Um, even here in the U.S., USAID is being reorged, um, AFP and Mercy Corps have been leading a coalition on the Global Fragility Act, and how do you pick out countries that um, pilot in stabilization and prevention countries and say, we have to do, we have to think about this country differently, and we have to say, what is our goal, and actually, you know, we can't just have our health program and our livelihood program and build this state from the top down and hope that, you know, eventually they'll be able to deal with it all. Um, so that's why I think this book is very opportune, um, because we need to have more of these discussions. Um, a couple of other things. Um, you know, I, um, I helped start up the Office of Conflict Management and, Conflict Management and Mitigation. Carrie Bruno was with me at the time. Um, and this is going back 2004. Yeah, so it was right after 9-11 um, in Afghanistan. And this office was set up to think about how do we deal with ungoverned spaces? Um, how do we deal with, um, how do we put conflict lens on this country? Um, and we put together this really nice and tidy framework, the conflict assessment framework. And then everybody was putting together their frameworks. Even within the US government, we have competing frameworks still to this day. Um, but it really looks at grievances. I mean, you will spend, and when people go out and do these assessments, they focus on what's the problem. Um, and instead of, I think, flipping it and paying more attention on mobilizers and means. And so that's why I look at, when you're talking about trade, I agree and I sort of, I think it's a bit more nuanced because in order to these groups to keep territory, to, um, you know, they have to have some means to do it. Um, and we, even in our own conflict assessment framework, we don't pay enough attention to that piece, and we're really stuck on those grievances. And then we apply our own framework of we need effective and legitimate governance. And that's one of the biggest pieces um, when we are looking at this state. Um, and again, when I was reading parts of this book, it was because that's our frame. That's what we know. Um, and it, it, so it, it, it's been, uh, for me even, you know, holding up, reading parts of this book and holding up the mirror and reflecting, um, you know, we, we don't, we don't do that very well. And we're applying our own lens on these states. Um, so I really loved what you were saying in terms of how is a state learning how to be a state? And we are trying to build that resilience so when these shocks are happening with these groups, um, you know, the state again can push back on it. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the liberal template is too rigid and righteous. And as someone who has spent at least half my career overseas in conflict affected and fragile states, you almost feel, how can I say this, um, not patriotic, <laughs> you know, to um, your own Western preconceived democracy, you're not a patriot. Um, you think very righteously about what is right um, and not recognize, you know, and, and thinking, um, you know, can we say it out loud? Maybe this model isn't the right model for this country. Um, so that's, we don't, uh, we, we kind of, I, as you were talking, I had, you know, everybody's had that game when you were little. It was the round hole, and you take the square piece, and you're like, just keep trying to jam it in there. Um, and it's not fitting. Um, so that's what I was thinking about when you were talking. Um, strengthening state is a double-edged sword. We are very good at this. Um, and we are very good at this. I call them the we like you countries for whatever reason we like them. Um, um, you know, because they have oil, they have location, they go into another country for us, like Ethiopia, into Somalia. And we're all working there and pouring in massive amounts of resources. And I had people in Ethiopia say to me, you know what, if the international community would leave us alone, we could actually, you know, we're strengthening this government that has incredible human rights abuses. 
um, that has, people are now in exile or they're in prison or, and obviously things are different um, now um, with the EPRDF um, no longer in power. But you know, to have people say to you, you are causing this um, and we know why you're here um, because you care about what Ethiopia can do and being in the Horn of, Af um, Horn of Africa. Um, so I also want to talk really quickly about violence and violent conflict. And at the end of the day, why that is so important, AFP just finished a violence subsec uh, a review on violence subsector, subsector review on violence reduction. And we don't also like to think about that. We are very good at thinking about state to state conflict, civil war, but violent conflict. Um, and we're not thinking about violence. But if you look at the US right now and what has happened in our own hemisphere um, and the violence um, that, uh, especially in um, the Northern Triangle, um, we, we are struggling to figure out what to do. Um, in fact, this administration is threatening or not threatening. They've decided to cut off aid um, to those countries. Um, and it's not a traditional violent conflict war, but if you look at what's happening there um, in terms of death, in terms of um, states that are struggling, you know, countries that are struggling to function, security, it's all the hallmarks of what we're seeing in other violent conflict affected countries or other um, countries that are at war. So one, I think just one other thing I want to talk about is evidence. And this is, our field is terrible at evidence. Um, we, um, we don't measure very well um, countries that are getting stable, more stable, um, sliding back into conflict. So at an overall level, we don't measure our programs and how they are contributing to peace building or stabilization. Um, we, especially in this field, we measure based on how was the program effective. We said we're going to have this many trainings, having this many trainings. We delivered, um, but we can't tell you if it had any impact on um, peace and stability. Um, and that's something very much AFP is in the forefront of working on. We have to hold ourselves accountable to that. Um, but there is research out there. And so one of the things I did want to talk a little bit about is um, you did Number talk. Number two minutes. Okay. <laughs> you did want to talk. You talked about um, prioritizing jobs. So to be a little more nuanced on that, we do know, and I go back to when we were back at um, CMM, back in the early days, um, in the early, right after 9-11, um, we were just throwing jobs at everything. Um, job you know, you got a job program, you got a job program. Um, and it wasn't reducing stability. I mean, it wasn't reducing violence. What we have found is you can provide um, uh, livelihood and education, but you also then have to couple it with programs that promote um, the ability to have a voice in the community. Um, the, abil the ability to um, make changes in the community. Because if you actually just prioritize jobs and education, you can actually cause more harm. Um, because people have these skills, um, uh, or they have the means, and then they start looking around at what's actually wrong um, and start focusing on that. So I just wanna, I, I wanna um, sort of leave it at that and talk about the fact that trade is very important and the economic, I mean, in many of these countries, you can look at the economic root cause, but for, you know, whatever you wanna call it, as really the destabilizing trend. Um, but there are, you know, it's not a sort of a one-stop shop. There are many other things that contribute to it. Um, Bosnia is a perfect example. I mean, most people think that it was an ethnic war. It was, but if you really go back down to the root cause of it, it was hyperinflation, economically destable. Um, so, so anyway, 
So I'll leave it at that and open it up to questions. But I have to tell you, it was uncomfortable reading this book sometimes <laughs> because you think, okay, well, um, you know, a lot of things that I've been doing personally, the work, you know, we've been promoting um, needs a serious rethink. Um, and, you know, it's uncomfortable to think about those things. So um, when we talked earlier this morning, Christine and I, um, you know, I said, this is, this is provocative. Um, and, and so it is, and it's meant to be, and I'm glad you wrote it. Um, and I hope more people read it. And we also take it into all the different frameworks that people are working on right now, rethinking how we build states, um, uh, build positive peace, and with that, I'll leave it. Thank you, Liz. Well, we're glad you wrote it, and we're glad we had Liz as the discussant, because you certainly got us all uh, thinking. And before we have everybody come in, we did reserve a final half an hour, so this has worked out great for uh, the Q&A and discussion. I will allow Christine, though, first to react if she has any points. I saw you taking careful notes. Anything you'd like to speak to, but please keep it to under two minutes so we have no, plenty of time I, to hear. I don't have very much to say, except that that is the po best possible reaction that I could possibly hope for, really. Like, for somebody to say that they read it, who works on this stuff, and say it made them uncomfortable, because it was damn uncomfortable for me to go through the process of doing it, right? Like, this was not a good process for me. I had to see Canada. I learned about Canada so much more about Canada actually in thinking through what happened in Liberia. It was only by thinking about state formation in Liberia that I was able to see what we had done to indigenous populations in Canada in a different way. And then I thought, oh my God, how could I have not seen that about my own country? How could I have not seen all of this? It was all there in front of my eyes. And then I had to undo you know, the entire way in which I've been educated and extremely privileged, right? So that's, that's a hard, and especially because I really felt deeply that I grew up in a country of equal opportunity, if not equal outcomes. And this project on Liberia weirdly forced me to think through, a, it made me uncomfortable as well. I hope that it will cause people to ask some hard questions and to have some of the harder conversations. Thank you so much, Liz. Can I start off and ask, I don't want to put Carrie on the spot, but Carrie, <laughs> <laughs> my old colleague Carrie, um, when I was talking a little bit about you know, how we were trying to package this in the early days of CMM, um, I mean, did what I say resonate a little bit in terms of the conflict assessment framework? And, and please kindly speak yeah. into the microphone as we have friends following us from live stream. Yes, and I think that, you know, there was a, a really intensive focus on grievance. I think since then, in the processes that we went through when we revised that initial framework into the CAF 2.0 and we developed an advanced training around it, we balanced some of that out in terms of um, focusing as much on sort of resilient systems and what is it that sort of pushes towards positive change, although that word positive can also be very loaded from a cultural perspective. But I think that, that you have a point in that the, the our, our framework has three components. The first is sort of that grievance and how institutions, small i, are interacting with different groups. The second component is sort of the key actors. But in that bundle is the key actors' um, resources, right? That resource piece that you're talking about doesn't get enough attention, right. right? The third component is triggers. That's, you know, dime a dozen on triggers. But it's really that second component in what I would call mobilization dynamics, which is what is the grease between those first two wheels, which is underlying grievances and things that enable people to, to be mobilized and the key actors and their resources, because there has to be that grease in between those two pieces that can accelerate that process of mobilization or um, escalation of dynamics. So yes, I would agree with that. I also agree with your point on the sliding scale, like back to the issue of the types of, of groups. And my question as you were presenting it had to do with groups that don't emerge after the conflict, but out of the conflict. And so, Sorry, can you say that again? Sorry, I was Sorry. listening to Richard. <laughs> groups groups that, that don't necessarily emerge in the post-conflict context is something that's completely new and has never existed before, but maybe it was a militia, 
And so it had some other purpose other than trade in the first place, and it may maintain vestiges of, of political objectives and interests that are either tied to that identity group or they're tied to making sure that that group remains um, in control of resources, which I think you acknowledged. So there was sort of that that I was grappling with in my head, and also this idea that in performing regulatory and, and justice functions, that it's impartial. Because I think that oftentimes, I, it was on one of the slides, but I think oftentimes it's not necessarily impartial. It can be just as predatory as state institutions. But um, by and large, I agreed with most of your presumptions, or, or most of your findings and your conclusions. I think that it tracks with what I've seen in practice. So thank you. And bravo, kudos. We'll take a few questions at a time. And when you introduce yourself, please mention what organization you're coming from as well, and then frame your question. Keep them going, moving quickly, please. Bob Berg. Hi, I'm from the three co-sponsoring organizations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two quick points. Uh, will you please tell uh, Richard uh, what code to use for ordering your books so we can, you know, we'll make it, he's the blame. We want the uh, real uh, deal, not yeah. this PDF. Yeah. 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 Okay. And Liz gets Another a quickie there. point is, I, I, I'm sure you, you're full of nuances in this, in this book, but we make a, an assumption prior to conflict that, that the industrial and corporate activities are the goods and then later on comes the bads, but actually the records of pre-wars can be pretty awful too. Uh, uh, people in the cocoa trade tell me that they had eight different export routes in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, maybe one of them was legitimate. Uh, yesterday, about a block from here, there are about 250 of us that listened to the World Bank talk about the evaluation of accountability and transparency. And it did seem to me that there was a one-size-fits-all kind of mentality on that, which was a little worrisome. And one of the things that was left out of that discussion was whether civil society under threat and plague all over the world is something we ought to be betting on a lot more. Now, I'm very interested in what you found out in Liberia, and you haven't talked about the Market Women's Association and all this other stuff. The question is, what, uh, what stress would you give in investing in post-war civil society in Liberia as a way of kind of sorting out bolstering a lot of these issues. We have one more question. Our colleague, Tori Holt. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Sorry, I have a croaky voice today. And, and I very much appreciate both presentations. Um, but I'm going to push back a little bit. You know, I think perhaps in the early 2000s, this idea that the state is all was true. But I think in the last decade, there's been a high level of recognition that you have to consult locally with the people, with community leaders, with all this. And I think there's a level of nuance that maybe is true in the book, but for your presentation is not always right. And I also don't think you mean to imply that um, illegal armed groups in the state could actually be equals in providing goods and services to the people. Because, and this is one of the roles I saw in the PC Commission, the PC Commission is there not just to support the state, but to protect civilians. And it may have done an inadequate job, but it had a Chapter 7 mandate to do that after one of the most horrific civil conflicts, and in that region with Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire next door. This was a really horrible, violent time. So the mission was not just there to beef up the government. However, it was also there fighting official corruption by helping support. It was a separate, was it one up? I forget. But there was an effort to put civil society into uh, government for the rubber, the timber, and the other industries so they would not be corrupt and that the coffers of the state would actually get some of the revenues back. So anyway, I'm just offering some complexity to this, but maybe the question to you is, how do you not end up arguing that extra legal groups are legitimate when they also commit human rights abuses and the way they govern could be quite brutal to the people they're overseeing? So the state may be flawed, it may also be worrisome, it may also uh, create some brutality, but it has a higher level of responsibility than perhaps these extra legal groups do. Thanks. Great. We'll let Christine uh, respond and take another round. I'm really hoping we hear from Professor Barton, one of uh, the mentors of Christine in her graduate studies. Christine. So I take all of um, the, the points that I think 
and including uh, Liz's points too, very well. And I think I get into this more in the book. And again, I think sometimes in a short ish presentation, sorry about how long it was actually was, I don't get into the complexity of it much. And I, there is a lot more nuance there. Part of it is that these groups are not, the things that I argue are partly abstract to be challenging, right? They're, they, this is an idealized way of thinking about this, but that is part of what is going on if we want to think about them differently, right? This is the, to challenge our thinking around who these people are, what they're actually doing, not without the judgment of they are bad because they've committed human rights abuses. So that's what I walked in with, right? I thought, my first thought is, these people can't possibly be doing anything good. I am primed to see them in a bad way. Uh, and then, but what I actually saw as I start at the beginning of the book, it, the thing that I expect to see doesn't look like what I was primed to see. It looks like something really different on the ground. So that was the first, okay, well, what do I do with this? Because I am expecting to see people walking around behaving much more violently. That is primed, what I'm primed to see uh, by the folks that are going with me, you know, on the UN side, right? We're walking, we're the ones that are walking in. I was the one that was landing with them, with Ethiopian peacekeepers, you know, like a good 20 odd of them in these places. They, on the other hand, didn't look the way that I expected them to look. So the challenge was to me about thinking about that. And I wouldn't say the, the groups are equal. This is not what I'm saying at all. And But to think about their legitimacy from the point of view of the local population, because the locals are thinking, maybe better the, the devils we know, even if we don't like them or trust them, but we trust the state even less, right? So if you're thinking about this group, and again, this maybe goes to an earlier question. Um, the group we may sort of be familiar with, and they're not as, we know the ways in which they're going to do the things and who they're going to, so they're more predictable in the way that they're going to be bad and who they're going to be bad to. So the predictability of this is important as well. And I've seen this more um, in the talks around ISIS and Predictability is very important to these environments. Sometimes you prefer a, a more brutal but predictable environment rather than a less brutal but unpredictable environment. And that's a really weird thought, right? Like, what do you do with that? So that's why sometimes people prefer the Taliban. Uh, and that's not, a, that's not a nice look for us in the West. So part of this is, is just challenging um, how we're thinking about this. And I, you know, I, I don't think that these groups are particularly nice. I don't think that they do the things that they're doing particularly well. Um, I'm not saying that they are good at what they're doing. Uh, and certainly that they are not good at providing impartial justice. But I think that's part of what they end up doing. They end up trying to be an in-between and in a place that didn't have somebody to be that in between, right? So at the end of war, it used to be that elders and actually secret societies and local chiefs and so on had more legitimacy to resolve these disputes and provide regulation. That's just not what things look like at the end of war, right? So there, that space is much more contested. They're trying to reclaim it, and now it looks different. But at the time, things were more uncertain, and I'm not sure that they wouldn't still remain uncertain. I think if I think Ellen Johnson Sirleaf did a darn good job, um, not on everything, but on this thing in particular. Um, Bob, you were asking about the, the civil, I mean, I want to answer everything, but I want to answer in particular the civil society question and accountability and transparency, because part of the work that we did was around corruption. Um, and I think one of the things that I didn't get to say here today was that we should think about corruption differently. Corruption is not, a different way of saying corruption in a lot of these cases is patronage, right? Patronage puts a different tone on it. And then there's also, if you want to put it this way, good corruption versus bad corruption, right? There's, there's, there's taking money and then putting all of it into a Swiss bank, bank account and that never gets reinvested in the local economy or the local community. That's a very different thing than saying um, taking half of that money and redistributing it locally and, and putting the other half into your Swiss bank account or taking 10% of it and redistributing the other 90%, which brings you an awful lot of legitimacy. And the Western frameworks that we typically use and that I've always used myself and the way in which I talk about it is there is you know that black letter of the law and one side is corruption and the other side isn't and there is no nuance between these two sides, right? And the reality doesn't look like that to most 
people that are in these places. There, there is a big difference between those two kinds of corruption where you are sharing and redistributing, even if only within your own ethnic or identity group, or as opposed to you know, just really keeping it all for yourselves. And if you are keeping it all for yourselves and people know, you will be punished for it by people within your own community, right? So there, is, there are these subtleties there that I think we need to recognize. And part of it is that what we're trying to do is gradually broaden the inclusivity of that quote-unquote corruption and move that into a public space. And part of that is that fight, I think, between state and society that goes on, between the elites that control, and then trying to, I would say, you know, co-opt these groups into getting to them to buy into this idea of the state, right? That is the, the kind of peaceful way to claw back that power into civilian hands, but it requires a very active effort to do that. We have about 10 minutes to go for a final round of questions. I have one, but I want to hear from this side of the room first. And we bring the microphone over. This is a trap, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. Well, Christine, as always, you, you are provocative and thoughtful, so thank you for that, and thanks, for Liz, for your comments as well. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit interested on the prescriptive side. So entrenchment doesn't sound like a great thing, but I didn't quite get a sense of how we should insert ourselves or could be helpful in addressing that. Um, the second thing on the on the liberal definition, is, is, is people power uh, an essential element of the liberal definition, or is it more universal than that, because it does seem as if you're giving preferred status here to kind of a known uh, quantity of people as opposed to sort of the, the ideal of people power, which I think actually kind of brings conservative and liberal thinking together generally. So so I'm, I'm not sure we're as entrapped by that. In fact, I think we've essentially avoided that because we've usually worked with elites. You've now found a different elite. Uh, and it's uh, and I'm not sure that it's going to have as, that much that great shelf life either. So I'd like to maybe that's the second part of the question. And then I wonder if you've if you've sort of accepted trade uh, for for predictability. So you, in the, in this conversation, you've made predictability and kind of a reliable society or something that you could go out and you can live within. Uh, and you've elevated that and trade. In this case, where you had diamonds, lumber, uh, and, and a totally unskilled workforce uh, or uh, war labor force that, that it needed to have something to do, um, I wonder whether that's the case. So those would be three questions. I, you know, I have, I've always had a favorite, a favorite idea, and I'd love to have you uh, knock it down a peg or two, and that is that when you have a situation like Liberia where you had – such a vast number of people who were uh, untrained, unskilled, as you described, uh, lived, they had preyed off of people that had been their livelihood for the last several years, maybe with a little sponsorship of, uh, of different sponsorship as well. Whether if you really wanted to get into the, I think, the classic liberal tradition, you might have created a national youth core or something like that. Now, that would that would have kept a lot more people busy than the occasional, and, and they wouldn't have been working any harder, and they might have been getting, gaining skills, and they might have become part of a society as opposed to having uh, sort of franchised the country. I worry a little bit about the franchising of the country because I could see these different, so anyway, quite a few things to think about. I'll let you take those as he was your former professor. And I know. We'll with How much do I owe Rick? Um, I can't. So yeah, the first kind of, I have to say, Rick was the person that took me into the field the first time in Guatemala and in Chiapas 18, 19 years ago. And I, that got me hooked, absolutely. And part of that was around conversations and listening to people and really trying to get a feel for where they're coming from. Uh, and I've always taken that from your work, Rick. Thank you so much for that. So how to how to speak to some of these things around what do we do? And that goes back to the civil society question, which sadly I didn't answer. But I, I'm, I'm going to get to it now because I do think that that is part of the positive answer, but it comes with nuance, right? Civil society groups also tell us a lot what we want to hear, and we need to be careful about that. So that dynamic is sometimes problematic. We don't often know what it is that we're really hearing. And even the folks that I trust and respect the most have said to me um, that they have been... 
you know, they, they will quiet their voices under certain occasions in order to get certain things done or maybe to take some money because they need to survive. And you know, that, that, that relationship is complicated because there is power and money between us. So, but bearing that in mind, I am a big advocate for what civil society can do in these situations. And I think people power is a great way of putting it. Part of what I didn't get to, again, in the subtleties of these places and these groups and how they work, there are different responses from local populations, right? Some of them have more agency than others. Some of them develop that agency. They start out as individuals who are contesting what is going on with the groups. And then they try and reclaim some of that space back. And in some cases, it's quite successful, right? And in other cases, less so. And the dynamics of that change over time um, as peace really kicks in. And that's the, I think that is part of the decline of like the just gradual decline of conflict capital. So thinking about what that looks like in that space, I think is the right way. I think people power is quite an important concept. I agree actually with the you know, what Liz was saying earlier on, that you need to have some of that engagement. You have to feel like you're invested in your society. I think that's totally true. And that, but I didn't emphasize that because that's already emphasized, I think, in the peace building work, certainly in the scholarship, and I think also in policy making and in organizations, right? We have lots of organizations dedicated to this the UNPBSO where Richard used to work and so forth. We are thinking about things already like that. What we are not doing, I think, as well is the economic side. And here I, I would just you know, beg to disagree. Maybe the US is doing a better job of it than I think other places are. I just don't think that the, the ways in which we think about effectiveness of outcomes is the same as the inputs that we put into these programs. And that's, I think, the important thing. Like, we can spend lots of money but that doesn't mean that the program actually works. And again, the Chatham House stuff that we're working on, um, hundreds of millions of dollars spent in Iraq on a local job creation program that my uh, colleague Renad Mansour has written, is what we're about to write about. And he makes the point that nobody locally actually knew anything about the program. So what the heck happened to those hundreds of millions of dollars? You know, that was a USAID program. We don't talk about that. We talk about the fact that we spent hundreds of millions of dollars, but we don't actually look at what comes out of that. So that's my concern, right? It's the, the, the two things we do care, we do think about it. There is nuanced understanding, but it doesn't seem to come out of the other side. And so when I talk to people in places and they give me that story and then they say, well, we, like, and I say, but we spent, we did this program. The UK did this program. What happened to it? Did it spend all this money? And I say, we don't know. Like, we, we don't see the thing that you say you did. I don't know what to do with the discrepancy between what I'm hearing on the one hand and then what I'm seeing on the other. And I'm just trying to say, look, there is something going on here. Can we please talk about it and be more honest about it? But it really gets at our own narratives. And I think that's, that's really challenging for us. I think the National Youth Corps would be a great idea. I think that's, you know, some kind of national youth program would have been well taken. Um, it's about money. It's about prioritization. It's about the fact that governments in these situations are contending with everything at once. Why do they choose to you know, focus on this, that, or the other, right? And I think Ellen made a really great choice in tackling these groups early on. I think, actually, if George Weah had been elected in 2005, I'm not sure that that's what he, we, he would have done. I think the country would have gone on a different path. Um, and we would end up with a very different Liberia today. So, you know, there there is space for agency in this discussion. I just think it's it's a hard space, and we have to really go into it with our eyes wide open. I see we have one or two minutes. Let me just finish with a, a short two-part question, and then, of course, people should follow up with Christine afterwards. Uh, We've been mentioning uh, the great president of recent years of Liberia, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, well-known at the World Bank. With her background and then with the big UN operation, one of the biggest peacekeeping missions at the time, it was led by somebody with a very strong development uh, background, Alan Doss, who was a boss of mine in Sierra Leone. And I know how innovative he is and sensitive to engaging uh, not just the UN system development programs, funds, agencies, but working with the bilaterals, working with the international financial. To what extent did they, uh, through their work, in a sense, reach and, and, and incorporate into their programming strategies some of the insights and conclusions that you brought. And then back to where we started at the beginning of this conversation, so much about state building and peace building is emphasized, overemphasized, political institution building, governance. And a big part of the literature has been, well, we know that the liberal models can't be 
uh, forced down the country's throats. So hybrid models of governance has become the, the norm to vote. And in the case of Afghanistan, it's well known the lawyer Jirgas helped to legitimize the democratic institutions, or Shuras working with state court systems were a much better way to reach the population that could not be reached by uh, often corrupt state courts. Are we looking at new models of uh, hybrid approaches to economic engagement that try to foster a legitimate private sector, build up a public revenue base, but also engage at the same time these extra legal groups knowing that they're not only uh, there and very real uh, economic actors, but they're, they're central to keeping the overall goal of the peace process moving forward? Easy questions, of course. Thanks, Richard. Um, so part of, I think, what you're asking is should we engage? And I think this goes back to um, Victoria's question earlier on as well. You know, to what extent should we legitimize these groups? I'm not sure about the answer to that. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about all of this, right? I'm just trying to be an observer pointing things out rather than a we should do this versus we should do that. Part of me feels like it's, it's not really up to me. I think the hybrid idea is helpful, though. It, it adds nuance to the kinds of concepts that we have, right? It allows for thinking about things the way that you have in your book, right? Like, it's, it opens up a space um, to say it doesn't have to necessarily look like this. And we, we might not like, actually, the substantive content of, and certainly the political content of these groups, but they are doing something that we need to acknowledge, and they might be doing it better than we could do it, and they might be doing it in a way that is palatable to local populations that suits the ways in which those societies operate that look really different from our own, right? So if we think about what happened in Somalia, um, you know, in 2006 with the, uh, you know, Islamic Courts Union and how the U.S., with the help of Ethiopia, basically drove them out. And then we see what has happened with Shabab now, right? That, like in hindsight, doesn't look like such a good move because we didn't like the content, especially post 9-11, and understandably so. But the fallout of that has been much, much worse. And part of that is the difficulty of the moment, right? And the politics you have to contend with. Um, and the, you know, the difficult atmosphere where we don't always like these groups, but it's hard to acknowledge that they might be doing something important for the people on the ground. How do you accept the fact that ISIS might be doing something that really looks like state building? And I've had arguments with people about this in the early, early days of the caliphate. I said, they are a state. Look at how they're operating. They are very state-like. They might die out, but they're doing all this stuff that looks like state building. And same thing with Hamas, right? But they are not legitimate groups. They are not legitimate entities in the eyes of the West. How do we have a conversation about what, what they're doing, who they are, and without necessarily being judgmental about them, right? So this is the setting aside our what is good and what is bad and just thinking about what they do and who they're doing it for and their relationships to local populations, just trying to not get ourselves vested in that conversation. I think it's, it's helpful. Thank you once again. Round of applause for Christine and Liz as well. Thank you to our co-sponsors, uh, Alliance for Peacebuilding, the United Nations Association of National Capital Area, colleagues at Stimson who helped to organize today's program. Uh, and finally, thank you to everybody who participated, followed us via a live stream. We very much uh, welcome you back. Look forward to uh, continued engagement on these issues of peace building and state building. Thank you once again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. That was a that was a fun conversation. You had all I of your friends here too. I loved it. Yeah. It was. Um, Thank, you for you you <laughs> Thank you for your pen. I'm sorry I stole it. Uh, <laughs> that was great. That was a riveting presentation and uh, great slides. I made me think. Oh, I was at the beginning, of the middle of my State Department career when I launched my book, and I wasn't. I felt shackled to do what you did, and I was like, oh, I missed the fun of going out and promoting uh, with the slides so and everything. So I can't back. after the fact. I, you hey, back. you brought it. You brought it up uh, after Come. the fact. Come, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the question there to your former pupil. <laughs> if you're, excellent. I mean, it's really very. Hey, let me oh. Thank you, Thank you. I, I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to You know, one thing I'm going to do in my course is uh, 